All right, my next guest will be fighting in the main event of Dana White's Contender Series coming up on September the 7th when he meets Joshua Quinlan. And, of course, I have Darian Weeks on the show. Darian, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man, I appreciate the time. And you're joining me from the barbershop, man. You were just finishing cleaning some people up. T tell me how that uh, balances between uh, doing that and then getting your uh, your training in. Yeah, it's a... Uh... It's a lot sometimes, but I mean, it, it, I like it. Uh, I own my own barbershop, so it's kind of easy for me to be flexible with clients. Um, so I kind of, you know, open some times up in the afternoon to get my training in and then uh, finish some people up and then go ahead and finish out the day and get my training in in the evening. So it's good. It would be worse if I worked for someone else. But uh, since I work for myself, it, it works out just fine. Yeah, That's fantastic. How many clients do you have? How many haircuts do you give uh, on average uh, a week? Oh, on average a week. Um, I probably do about 15 to 20 a day. Um, so in a week, I mean, anywhere from 80 cuts, you know, 65 to 80 cuts. So it's, uh, it's quite the, uh, it's quite the booming business. I live in a town, probably 30,000 and there's not really, you know, that many barbershops to choose from. So people come in, you know, by the floods. So it's a, uh, it's a busy day every day, probably. Yeah, no doubt. What, what's like the, uh, the most go-to haircut nowadays? Is it like a low fade, high fade? Like what are most people getting? It's definitely the comb over high fade. People love that. Oh, let me whip my hair to the side and uh, blend it all the way up. Uh, so, I mean, that's it. When I get a good 10 or 12 of those in a day where I can just do the same thing in a row, that makes a day go by that much easier. You know, it's just the same haircut over and over again. Very cool. I'm happy that things are going well for you and you have your own business there. That is fantastic. Now, this opportunity here at Dana White's Contender Series, I mean, what, what a big deal. I mean, this is really a lot of people launch their careers off of a performance here in front of the boss at the Apex. When did you find out uh, about this opportunity? Um, I found out about this opportunity probably like uh, right at the tail end of May, I think it was, and which is weird. I was actually getting a ready for a boxing match that I was going to do at, uh, I think it was for the promotion PBC underneath the Devin Haney card. Um, I actually had to turn that opportunity down, um, uh, because of this one arose. Um, but no, yeah. Uh, and I was super stoked. I was super excited when I heard about it. Um, this is what I've been chasing. You know, this is what a lot of MMA fighters chase, you know, when they start this out and me coming from a small town, you know, right in the middle of Missouri, uh, you really don't think, you'll get that much clout or that much pickup off of, you know, only five wins. So I was really impressed to understand and hear that I was going to be fighting in Dana White's contender series. Not only that, you fight as the main event even, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I feel like that is pretty big in itself, you know what I'm saying? Oh, of course. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I was going to ask you, too, because I saw that you had a boxing uh, bout in April earlier this year. So I wasn't sure when you found out about this opportunity. I was going to ask if, you know, you still took that boxing bout even after. But I, I understand that now you're saying May you found out. So what has life been like for you since then? Have you just been getting that, that working in the gym and doing your job? Just that, that nice balance? Definitely. Yeah, uh, just find a nice balance and, you know, just, you know, putting some stuff in my game that I don't normally do, you know, just trying to upgrade the little things. Um, but yeah, no, it's been work, 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 you know, uh, trying to keep my body healthy, but at the same time, train as hard as I can every day. Um, so it's definitely, uh, it's definitely been, um, you know, a kind of a change for me because I mean, mostly you can see in my career, I mostly take a fight every uh, month and a half to two months, you know, whether it be boxing or MMA, I try to stay relatively busy. Um, but this has been three months now ago that uh, I heard about this information. So uh, trying to just keep myself focused, keep myself, you know, steady on the path, you know, steady on the grind, even though I don't have a match right around the corner, which brought us to, you know, two weeks out. And, you know, now I'm feeling more ready than ever. Yes, sir. Now tell me a little bit about your gym, your training partners, coaches. I see you got that Jackson Wink t-shirt on. Uh, how often do you make your way down there to work with those killers? For sure, yeah. Um, I'll probably make my way down to Jackson Wink uh, probably once every two months or so. Uh, I normally only stay for about a week. Um, I use it mostly as a uh, way to kind of test myself to see if I'm ready for the fight. Um, I got a lot of good guys that I train with here in Missouri. But, you know, once you get training around guys, the same guys consistently, it's hard to kind of see or define that 
kind of line of where you're getting better or where they're just getting used to what you're doing, you know? Um, so I like going down there. They have a bunch of great athletes. Like they said, they're one of the best gyms in the country. Um, they have great athletes down there, uh, a great outsource of a lot of talent. So I get to match myself up against a lot of different things that I don't normally see all the time. So I love going out there, um, and training and, you know, getting those looks that, you know, I don't ever see, but my gym down here also, I mean, it has a lot of good killers. Uh, there's a guy, Will Starks. Um, he's fought in Abu Dhabi on, uh, I think it was Khabib's card in front of Dana White. Um, I've got a guy, Dallas Jennings. Um, he fought the opponent I'm fighting actually now. He fought him the last fight for LFA um, and did, I mean, damn good against him. I mean, he put him, he put the work on him. So I feel like I got a lot of good partners, especially for this fight coming up. I got a young guy, Mervin Miller. He's uh, an amateur actually now, but he's about to make his first debut amateur on LFA. Um, he's the number one light heavyweight in the mid, uh, the mid Missouri right now. So I mean, I mean, I got some animals around me, and I got a great coach in Rob Hewlett um, and Jose Zaragoza. He's a boxer, a professional boxer. He puts the work on me with mitt work, and he shows me a lot of good techniques. Um, my conditioning coach uh, John Moppins, he makes sure I'm well conditioned. So I mean, I got a lot of good, a lot of good people around me who put the best foot forward into making me the best athlete that they can. This fight is obviously at welterweight. What do you typically walk around at? Like, what, what are you right now? Uh, and how, how will this cut be? Is it, should it be a pretty easy one for you? Um, I will say I never miss the weight cut. I will say that. Um, but, uh, you know, being, being a, a, a guy who works out all the time, uh, you're going to gain muscle, you know what I mean? Especially when you're outside of camp and you're eating, you know, kind of reckless, you know, you're going to be a bigger frame. Right now, uh, my frame that I walk around at is probably north of uh, 197. Um, and right now I'm one about 190, um, kind of, you know, tapering myself down, getting ready for the big water cut. Um, but no, yeah, it's a it's a drastic cut, but I use the cut to kind of get my mind developed and ready for the fight. Uh, as a lot of fighters will tell you, the cut is just the hard part. After the cut, I mean, all we do is go out there and work, you know. So I use that cut to strengthen my mind, to go ahead and just mainly stay focused on the fight as I'm cutting those poundages down and getting down to that dehydration stage. I noticed in prepping for this interview that you had a really extensive amateur background you were 15 and 4 if i'm not mistaken as an amateur why did you decide to to stay in the amateur ranks for as long as you did and and just tell me a little bit about your evolution as a fighter to to how you got where you're at now yeah the uh my my reason for staying in amateurs is just a lot of guys go into amateurs four or five fights and then they think you know hey i'm ready for the pros and most of them do that as a rush to get paid um as you can tell right now i have my own career so it wasn't really a rush for me to get paid. So I took it as an example, then might as well just learn as much as I can. Um, I really had, I went ahead and went as uh, many as I could. I fought in Bahrain uh, in a five day tournament twice, um, fought over in Australia uh, against over like 68 countries. And so I really got to see a lot of techniques that you know normal people wouldn't get to see if they only did four or five fights right here in the US. Um, so I, I used it more as a learning curve. I wanted to make sure once I got to this pro level that there was no obstacles that I hadn't seen. There was nothing that I couldn't overcome. Um, so I really I really uh, spent a good time developing. And not only that, I love the sport of MMA. So there was no rush in me jumping straight into the pro. You know, I wanted to go ahead and experience it and, and develop it for as much as I can. You know, I just loved my – I just – you know, love the art. So I just wanted to participate in whatever thing I could. And once you get to that pro level, there's really only one direction to go. But when you spend it in an amateur, as I told you, you can go tournaments, you can go however other style in any other sport. So I wanted to make sure I got it all in before I really took it off with it. That makes sense. And here you are now headlining a Dana White's Contender Series card. It's a big deal. When, when you look at, I guess, welterweights in general, like the 170-pound weight class in the UFC, how do you feel you stack up right now? Because, you know, I've always felt like 
welterweight and lightweight to me have been the deepest divisions for as long as I can remember because it's kind of like the the average size man in a sense, you know what I mean? Like you guys get up to 190 walking around it and then you're cutting that weight down to 170 or 155. So it's just a deeper pool to choose from. So how do you feel you stack up with those guys right now that are in the show? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It's the deepest pool right now. And I mean, and it's the most um, athletic, you know, divisions in the, in the league right now. Uh, I feel like I stack up well. I feel like my all around athleticism, uh, brings uh something great to the game i feel like uh my strength and my overall skill set will stack up against a lot of these welterweights as i answer that division after the contender series um to be dominant there um there's a lot of guys that are good wrestlers there's a lot of guys that are good strikers but there's very few who are good strikers and good wrestlers and i pride myself on both of those the reason being that's why i took the boxing bouts that i have on my um on my tapology right now and i feel like me bringing both of those to the game is going to bring a lot of confusion to fighters when I'm fighting them, you know what I mean? They they, they might try to take me down as I'm striking with them, uh, but I defend the takedown real well. Or they might try to outstrike me, you know, get a, get, get a good striker, and then I hit a double leg, you know, right on the right time. And now they have to work their way up and uh, deal with me doing that. So I feel like my I, I'm almost perfect to be right here in that division with 155 or 170. I love that answer. One fight that I cannot wait to see here later this year. I'm not sure if they've actually announced an official date yet, but is that welterweight title rematch between Usman and Covington? I'm just salivating waiting for this rematch because they don't like one another and their skill sets are both just so amazing. Give me a little preview, a little prediction. How do you see that that rematch shaking out? Yeah, uh, that is a, uh, a rematch I'm excited for as well. Right now, as you can see in this division, um, Usman's being very dominant, um, and not only is he being dominant with his wrestling, um, he's being dominant in his last couple fights, as you've seen, with his striking as well. But, uh, I mean, the only person that can match him right now in the division, as we've seen, is Kobe Covington. You know, they went five rounds. Um, unluckily, you know, Kobe Covington got his jaw broken that fifth round, but this is the fight to be, you know, he's seen Usman before now, you know, he's able to prepare, uh, you've seen Kobe Covington put a dominant performance on Tyrone Woodley. Um, he's, I mean, he's the man right now, you know, and a lot of people don't like him. And I mean, we all know that's just a front that's just cheap talk, but I mean, when it comes to skill set, you can't deny skill set. Uh, so I feel like, um, uh, I mean, I don't want to go against, you know, the grain, but I really feel like Kobe Covington, may be a person who may come out on top on this, you know. He's uh, got the hunger. You know, Usman's defended the belt a couple times. Once you, I feel like once people stay at the top for a little while, you know, that hunger kind of kind of dissipates, you know what I mean? It, it's not as strongly there to someone who's still chasing, still trying to be relevant, still trying to make it to that top. So um, I'm going to think that, you know, Kobe Covington, you know, may, may win it by decision. Um, but then again, you know, it's MMA, so – there's anything that can happen. I can't wait for that fight. Let's uh, dive in and talk about your fight here. And uh, I want to know who's going to be your cornerman uh, come the big night here, September 7th at the Apex. Uh, yes, it's definitely going to be uh, my head coach, uh, Robert Hewitt, and then uh, also my conditioning coach, John Moppins. Uh, they're definitely going to be the two people in my corner. They're always the guys that I have in my corner. Um, so I just ride with comfortability, you know, especially being on a stage as big as a contender series, you know, not being there before, uh, you want to, you want to be as comfortable as you can, you know what I mean? So you want some good voices in the, in the corner that are really, uh, rememberable to you that you can respond to quickly. So, um, I feel like that's going to be my team for a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and ride with them in the corner and it's going to be a, a good night for a W. So this will be at the apex, which means you're not going to have thousands of screaming fans in the arena. They'll all be watching on ESPN Plus. But tell me, how does that affect you, good or bad? Are you one of those fighters that feeds off of that energy of the crowd, or does it really matter to you once you get in there? Um, I'm kind of a person who, once I get in there, it's as calm as you know, a summer breeze. You know, I I don't really hear the roaring of people. I don't really hear. The confusion of the crowd. Um, I'm, I normally uh, see the goal in front of me, and then I go ahead and just try to uh, take hold of that goal as as the match goes on. So I feel like it won't bother me one bit. I mean, the walkout, you know, people always get hyped up for 
the crowds, you know, screaming for him. But my last uh, my last fight at LFA, uh, they didn't really have a crowd there either. So um, I went ahead and walked in the ring, and I mean, it was business as usual. So I feel like this will be the same, you know. So your opponent, Josh Quinlan, he's 5-0, and oh, all finishes. He was also undefeated as an amateur, so he's, he's clearly got a nice skill set himself. When you look at this matchup stylistically, how do you think it's going to break down uh, come fight night? Uh, for one, stylistically, this matchup is uh, perfect, I feel like. Uh, for me, um, I feel like he does a lot of things that I'm great at capitalizing on, um, and I feel like I, I defend a lot of things that he's great at capitalizing on. So, um, but I also feel like this matchup stylistically is perfect for the viewers as well. You know, I feel like they'll get, you know, a banger, you know, we're going to go in there, we're going to put on a show and I'm definitely going to end with the finish, but they're definitely going to get a finish. You know what I mean? Um, it's going to be, uh, a good, a good entrance into the, uh, UFC for me, you know, uh, against a strong opponent like him, he's strong, he's headstrong. Uh, he's mentally strong when he gets in there. Um, so me being able to break somebody like that and get the finish on him uh, will definitely put me at a, a, a high pace from when I'm starting in that division in the welterweight in the UFC. So you say you're going to get the finish. Does it get out of the first, or are we going deeper into this fight? Are we going into the second or third round? Uh, I believe it gets out of the first, you know, especially with a strong opponent like he is. Um, I don't think he'll fold in the first five minutes. Um, you know, uh, and his training will make sure he doesn't fold in the first five minutes. But uh, I'm definitely going to be persistent. You know, I'm going to be relentless and coming after him. Uh, and the finish will come. You know, I, I got to wait till it develops. You know, there's always a moment where you see it happen, where you see, oh, this is the time to do that. And I feel like that will that will arise for me, whether it be um, late in the second or early in the third. We're definitely going to going to get the job done. When you look at his game, is there one area that you feel like you hold a distinct advantage over him at? Um, maybe not a distinct, but um, just just the way that I put my game together and the way that he does his. You know, um, I see him as a person who, when he comes into a fight, he has game plan and he sticks to that game plan no matter what happens. Um, I'm a guy that is the person who can uh, change the game plan and in a moment's notice if I feel like there's something better or there's something different or we can do this besides this or he's reacting to this instead of this. Uh, I'm a person who's really diverse. I go in there and watch my opponent and then uh, I unravel my skill compared to what he reacts of. So I feel like that's probably the biggest thing. Um, I'm able to break down my opponent even in the middle of the fight, um, which that's going to be a, a big thing for me. I can't wait. September 7th, Dana White's Contender Series. Darian Weeks, Joshua Quinlan, main event, welterweight bout. Pleasure interviewing you for the first time, my friend. Before I let you go, I want to give you the floor. Tell people where to follow you on social media, and if you have anyone to thank, any sponsors, the floor is yours. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, first off, you guys can follow me on 19 Darian 93 on Instagram. Um, Darian Weeks, just on Facebook. Also, shout out to my sponsors, uh, Salty Sun CBD. Um, SE Fuel here in Sedalia. It's a nutrition company. Um, I got uh, Apex, and I also got Quench Juice, and oh, um, and I Total Fitness Gym. So you guys can um, check out those sponsors and uh, go ahead and give me a follow, and uh, you'll see more information on those as my as my career goes on.